Marina Keegan, a 22-year-old Yale graduate, wrote in her journal, We don't have a word for the opposite of loneliness, but if we did, I could say that's what I want in life. She wrote these words before her life was cut short by a tragic car accident in May of 2012. The essence of such wise words from a life so suddenly taken in death bring to the surface a human need that we all have, the need to belong. It could be said that the opposite of loneliness is a sense of belonging. We are conditioned from the earliest moments of life with a need for belonging. In most circumstances, as soon as we're born into this world, we belong. We belong to a mother. We belong to a father. We belong to a family. We belong to a community. And with that belonging comes a feeling of safety and security, a sense of one's place in the world. As we grow, we search for ever-widening circles of belonging. We find ourselves striving to fit in and be accepted among our peers. The driving reason for this is the need to belong. We search for belonging in career choices and in civic organizations. We search for belonging in a spouse. But life has a way of chipping away at this feeling of belonging. Separations and broken relationships have a way of alienating us causing us to lose hold of the reality of our belonging. Betrayals and failures, although a part of every person's life, leave us isolated and alone. And that's really what we all fear, doing life alone, venturing out with no one by our side. It is completely natural to think that we forfeit the sense of belonging when we go it on our own. But that was not the case with an 18-year-old Scottish girl by the name of Margaret Wilson. She had taken a lonely road for most of her formative years, living in wilderness caves, trying to simply survive when she was only in her teenage years. In all that time, she never lost sight of her belonging. Even in the final moments of her life, when it seemed that all the world was against her, She spent the last breaths of her body boldly affirming that she belonged to only one. I'm Ronnie Brown, and this is Forgotten. By the early 17th century, England and Scotland had joined the Reformation, departing from Catholicism. But that did not mean they were both cut from the same cloth, so to speak. A hundred years earlier, King Henry VIII decreed that England would break from the Catholic Church. But in doing so, he decreed that he alone was, quote, the only supreme head in earth of the Church of England, end quote. On the other hand, The Reformation in Scotland was led by John Knox. Now, much could be said concerning this giant of the Reformation and the rise of Presbyterianism in Scotland. He wielded a power in Scotland that rivaled the very monarchy. Mary, Queen of Scots, is reported to have said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than the assembled armies of Europe. But one thing is for certain. Despite all of his power in the church and in the affairs of the nation of Scotland, John Knox was clear in his teaching that the head of the church is Jesus Christ and him alone. Now, there are other points of contention between the Church of England and the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, to be sure. The Church of England had a shadow of papal resemblance that did not sit well with the Church of Scotland. Also, appointments of bishops and pastors were completely at the will of the monarchy and not the local church. John Knox had laid a doctrinal foundation from the Bible that would not yield room for the Church of England, and that foundation held strong long after his death in 1572. But over the successive decades, regal pressure was placed on Scotland to accept the Church of England doctrine. 
1643, it became necessary for the Church of Scotland to outline their objections to conforming the religious practice. A document called the Solemn League and Covenant was drawn up. Scores of faithful Scottish Christians signed the document, many drawing blood from their own veins and using it as ink to solemnize the act. During the successive reigns of King Charles II and King James VII in the mid to late 1600s, the pressure to conform to the Church of England practice, thereby bowing the knee to the King of England, became violent. The years roughly from 1679 to 1688 were known as the Killing Time. Signers of the Solemn League and Covenant, known as Covenanters, began to be hunted, tortured, and executed. As many as 18,000 Christians who would not compromise their beliefs suffered persecution. Covenanters were forced to run into the hills and in the countrysides and hide. They would meet in secret open-air meetings called conventicles. Every time they would meet, they would run the risk of being caught and imprisoned, banished from their country, or even executed. Bloodthirsty members of the British Army would scour the countryside looking for rebels. Any person that failed to attend the Church of England services would be fined and suspected of being a rebel, then subjected to questionings even under torture. Upon suspicion of being a covenanter, a person would often be asked to declare the oath of abjuration. It's a statement renouncing the Solemn League and Covenant and swearing allegiance to the Crown of England as the head of the Church. It was in this heated time of religious oppression that Gilbert Wilson, a farmer of modest means in Glenfernock, parish of Penningham, Scotland, became the father of a daughter by the name of Margaret in 1667. In all, he would have five sons and two daughters and do his best to avoid trouble in those volatile days. Gilbert Wilson and his wife were dutiful members of the Church of England, willingly surrendering their doctrinal beliefs in order to avoid trouble. But his sons and daughters refused to yield what they knew to be true from the Word of God, choosing rather to suffer the consequences. History tells us that in 1684, an 18-year-old Margaret, her brother of 16 years of age, Thomas, and her sister, Agnes, aged 13, fled from their home into the nearby hills to hide from British troops. There they would hide, living in caves and huts, doing whatever they could to survive. In February 1685, King Charles died, and a new king, King James, ascended to the throne. With the change in power, it looked as though there might be a relaxing of the persecutions aimed at the nonconformists. In the mind of Margaret and her siblings, it seemed to be a good time to be reunited with fellow believers. Leaving behind their hiding places, Margaret and Agnes went down into Wigstown to visit with friends, particularly an elderly widow by the name of Margaret Malachlan. While they were there, they were all betrayed by a local man who reported their presence to the authorities. It was then that the two Wilson girls, along with the elderly Margaret, were taken prisoner. Once taken prisoner under suspicion of being a covenanter, they were asked to make the oath of abjuration to which they all refused. They were brought to trial on the 13th of April, 1685, and the trial was a farce. During the proceedings, the girls were accused of participating in the Battle of Bothwell Bridge, a skirmish between British troops and Covenanter forces that took place when the girls were only small children. In the end, all three were sentenced to be tied to posts that were fixed in the sand within the flood mark at the mouth of the Bloodnock River, and there stand until the floodwaters flowed over them and they drowned. Gilbert Wilson, unwilling to yield quiet to the execution of his daughters, sold almost everything he owned and borrowed from friends and family and managed to raise a hundred pounds, which was an enormous sum at that time and he rode to Edinburgh to buy his daughter's pardon. He was only able to acquire the release of one, Agnes, his youngest child. (music) 
On May 11, 1685, Margaret Wilson, along with Margaret McLaughlin, were taken to the Binnock River, a tributary of the Irish Sea in the North Atlantic, to have their executions carried out. The two women were separated by some distance. The elder Margaret was taken closer to the advancing tide. This was so the younger Margaret would watch her friend die, causing her to relent to their demands to recant. With each wave, Margaret Wilson saw the waters mounting higher and higher, from Margaret's knee to her waist, then to her neck and chin, and finally her lip. In the end, she watched her friend sink completely into the salty waters of the tide. But what was supposed to strike terror in the heart of the young woman had the opposite effect. When a heartless bystander, possibly one of the soldiers, asked young Margaret what she thought of watching her friend die, she replied, What do I see? But Christ in one of his members wrestling there. Think you that we are the sufferers? No, it is Christ in us, for he sends none a warfare upon their own charges. As the tide slowly rose around the body of young Margaret, eyewitnesses testify that she began to sing the 25th Psalm, starting at verse 7. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake. O Lord, good and upright is the Lord, and therefore will he teach sinners in the way. Her executioners allowed her hands to be free, binding only her waist to the stake in the waters. In her hand was a Bible from which she read aloud. The cold waters of the Atlantic echoed with her angelic voice as she read from Romans chapter number 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Moments later, the waters reached her lips and she began to struggle. The detail of soldiers overseeing the execution were commanded to go out to her and to give her one more chance to relent. The guards loosened the ropes enough to lift her head above the water. Pray for the king, for he is the supreme over all persons in the church, they said. With gentleness in her voice, she said, I wish the salvation of all men and the damnation of none. The frustrated soldiers thrust her head back under the waters. Drawing her back up, they demanded, Pray for the king, swear the oath. A broken-hearted spectator nearby cried out to Margaret, Dear Margaret, say God save the king. Just say God save the king. Margaret responded, Lord, give the king repentance, forgiveness, and salvation, if it be thy holy will. Her watching supporters suddenly pleaded with the authorities over the execution. Sir, she has said it. She has said it. But they were not satisfied. It was demanded that she should swear the oath of abjuration or be lowered into the sea, never to return. In that moment, Life hung in the balance. She was alone. More alone than any human being could be. With her face pale and her lips turning blue, she said these words, I will not. I am one of Christ's children. Let me go. With a sneer in his voice, A soldier forced her underneath the water, saying, Take another drink. And moments later, Margaret's lifeless body swayed with the ebb and flow of the evening tide.
there are countless instances in life where we will be alone, where we will be void of that sense of belonging, moments where we will have to do life with no one at our side, times when it seems like the whole world is against us. It is in those moments where we must find that our experience of belonging need not end when the last person we know turns their back and walks away. Through the one who not only overcame life, but defeated death and reigns supreme in the heavens, we can belong. Belong in such a way so as to never be truly alone, to always know the security and the safety of being the treasured possession of the living Christ. Through Him, we can say along with Margaret Wilson, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Forgotten is written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. And as always... Thanks for listening.